Uh, okay, guys, uh, we're going to get started. Uh, we are sorry for the delay. Uh, thank you all for joining us today for our LIPS presentation. Our speaker today is uh, Dr. Gayatri Kalra, uh, adjunct assistant professor at Columbia University. Uh, I am an Adimina, the second year student in urban planning program. Uh, I'll be moderating the section today. Um, before I introduce our speaker for today, a couple of logistical moments. Uh, first of all, uh, we are recording today's lecture, so if you don't want to be recorded, please keep that in mind. Uh, after the presentation, we will have a Q&A session. Uh, we'll start the Q&A around 2 p.m. to 15, uh, so we'll have enough time for everyone's questions. I will aim to give everyone an opportunity to ask the questions, so please, if you had a chance to do so, uh, give others a space to ask their questions. Uh, to ask the question, please raise your hand and I'll uh, get to, back to you. Uh, unfortunately, we are sorry we don't have food today. We'll have it next week, so please don't worry. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm excited to introduce our speaker for today. Gayatri Kalwar is an urbanist researcher and adjunct assistant professor at Columbia University. Her research uses quantitative methods and geospatial tools to engage debates about governance, technology, and justice through the lens of infrastructure and geography. The recent publication examines the effects of spatial inequalities in the availability and access to critical infrastructure on, spatial, on health vulnerability in New York City during COVID-19. Professionally, Gayatri works as a data science consultant and recently co-founded Earth Labs, an enterprise focused on simplifying the way we interpret blockchain data. Previously, she worked as a strategy analyst at the Rockefeller Foundation in New York, Gayatri holds a PhD in urban planning program and is a master uh, in global thought from Columbia University. So please welcome Dr. Gayatri. Hey everyone. Wow, it's so weird to be back here. Um, I just graduated in the summer and also hosted LIPS like a couple of years ago. So it's kind of surreal. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time introducing myself. Um, I'm actually teaching the informatics class this fall. So to all my informatics students that are here, grateful. Thank you. Um, and yeah, I, I just wanted to talk a little bit today about my dissertation research, which I very recently finished. So it's pretty fresh. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Um, I'll be focusing more so on the methodological and theoretical considerations of my research less so on the findings and results of the work. So hopefully this way it's a bit more engaging and opens up some interesting questions uh, for us to think about. So the agenda for today, um, we'll talk about some of the themes for my research, uh, one of which is disruption as method. Um, we'll talk about why does infrastructure matter. Um, we'll go into topics of actors and agents uh, in the process of infrastructure and government, um, information geography, which Today's lecture, and well, I'll end with some closing remarks, um, some conversations to study, and open it up. Um, so, with that, I'll get into it. Um, so, I wanted to start with what I call um, disruption as method. Um, here, I essentially use COVID 19 um, as an entry point um, to engage debates about infrastructure, power, and justice through the lens of um, geography and technology. And I've kind of done this throughout my work, um, so I'll be presenting one of those um, studies. Um, I essentially argue that the COVID-19 pandemic has been a prism and an amplifier um, for the uneven geographies of the city, and it's revealed decades of history that have worked to maintain boundaries between communities um, in New York. Um, so in this research, I actually critically examine the paradoxes, linkages, and questions embedded in um, infrastructures that shape uh, and are shaped by the politics of pandemic. Um, I, I use Stephen Graham's um, concept of infrastructural disruption um, here to discuss New York City's uneven geographies during the crisis. Um, so according to Graham in his chapter, When Infrastructure Fails, um, infrastructural disruptions are heuristic devices uh, which reveal the hidden politics of daily urban life and serve to problematize the very normalities of stable flow and circulation. This conceptualization essentially follows from the idea that design is invisible until it fails. So power blackouts, subway system failures, things like that, um, all bring the city's electrical circuits and transit systems into clear view. 
Um, and sociologists of technology essentially call this uh, a social process of unblackboxing or unmasking of complex systems and technologies that shape our everyday lives. Similarly, um, Colin McFarlane, um, in his book, Infrastructure, Interruption and Inequality, um, finds a relationship between inequality, interruption, and infrastructure um, <clears throat> in his fieldwork in cities of global south that I also believe applies here. Um, and he essentially talks about the fact that um, crisis, uh, in, uh, crisis in infrastructure essentially reinforces power relations in local government response. Um, crisis themselves are actually mediated by forms of inequality and particular forms of crisis become the new normal for some people. With our, which are worth um, paying attention to. Um, and finally, um, in their analysis of the 2008 foreclosure crisis, um, a study by Pays et al. emphasized the crucial role of neighborhood perceptions during crises. They essentially argue that, um, that neighborhood sentiment, resident sentiment, um, influence mobility decisions, often reinforcing urban area stereotypes and perpetuating spatial inequalities. Um, so again, this underscores the criticality in examining participation in 311, uh, especially in a moment of infrastructural disruption, as it offers insights into neighborhood socioeconomic disparity, conflict, decay, and the role of the state um, in mediating some of the preferences. So for context, this study, um, I look at New York City's uh, non-emergency -emer complaint line, 311, uh, which essentially is a repository of millions of geocoded citizen requests that have historically displayed, I argue, um, uneven geographies of participation. A lot of you in the informatics class have had exposure to this and for others have as well, um, but it's a really interesting data source, especially uh, for um, urban analysts in New York. Um, and especially during the pandemic, um, the, which bore witness to a flurry of neighborhood level tensions between race uh, and public health, protection and policing, social order and justice, safety and privacy, um, the 311 system became a critical line of communication as citizens grappled with escalating health threats, stringent government restrictions, and a hiatus in city infrastructure provisions in general. Um, in particular, the surge actually peaked in August 2020 with a total of about 300,000 requests made, almost 100,000 more requests than average monthly rates um, over the last decade. Um, another feature of 2020 was uh, the elevated crime rate that New York saw more so um, than it's seen in an entire decade, um, also followed by mass protests triggered by George Floyd's death and um, existing racial tensions and police brutality that uh, sprung up that year in particular as well. Um, in response to this, the Department of Technology actually introduced a number of new complaint categories um, that are related to social distancing violations. So some of these here are like non-compliance with phase reopening, mass gathering complaint, non-emergency police matter related to social disorders. So all of this is kind of the system responding to uh, new levels of interaction with the, with the service and what that kind of means for um, levels of distress um, or service demand that are not being met or um, trying to be met by um, the pandemic city or the response to the pandemic. So, uh, my research hypothesis essentially is that the engagement in 311 surged in socially vulnerable neighborhoods in 2020, um, driven by COVID 19 case rates and escalating socioeconomic tensions. Um, I also argue that complaints regarding social disorder, in particular, um, made up a majority of the increased call volumes in these areas, revealing a heightened propensity for residents to police uh, their neighbors during moments of crisis. And we'll unpack what that is. <clears throat> but this, is that, this research essentially is meant to offer some new methods and approaches to understanding existing questions of power, race, class, order, and um, And ultimately, I, I show that the uneven geography of 311 complaints in New York City during the pandemic is an important in indicator of the existing cracks in neighborhood cohesion, public trust, and technocratic governance that pervade the city's underlying infrastructure. And the pandemic actually offers a mirror to better understand some of the forms of power and the political economy that underlie. Um, 
So to get to the question of why infrastructure matters, um, as you'll see, infrastructure is a key component of this work and it's critical um, to my dissertation research in general. Um, I use infrastructure here as a mater material vehicle um, to analyze the relationship between people, justice, and space. Um, I think understanding the city um, and its systems through the lens of infrastructure, um, which is an otherwise mundane aesthetic material form, is actually a fascinating methodological exercise. And I think allows for some sometimes like absurd yet insightfully paradoxical linkages and questions that, that may be worth exploring. Um, so my research actually explores three different modalities of infrastructure. One is the mobile phone, one is the 311 um, complaint line, and the last one is um, infrastructure services in, in general. So for the purpose of this talk, I'll focus on the 311 platform. And ultimately, my goal is to observe how each of these forms of infrastructure shape and are in turn shaped by uh, the pandemic. So what is infrastructure? Um, infrastructure is essentially vast, intricate networks of physical, technological, and organizational systems that bring modern life. In According to Reinhold Martin, who is a professor here, um, Infrastructure is actually that which repeats. So essentially systems that repeat themselves constantly, railroads, postal services, satellites, highways, housing, housing, classrooms, all of these things that were in the process of cons uh, consistent re uh, repeated forms are essentially. And I take this further to say that um, they're not only a system of repetition, but they're also a system of measurement and record that quantify, track, and maintain our everyday interactions, um, shaping our local and environment in critical ways. Um, in terms of the scale of infrastructure, um, Paul Edwards argues that there's three different scales. Um, the first is micro, which is individuals and small groups, macro, which is institu institutions, um, standard setting bodies, and then the last one is large scale system structures like political economies of countries, um, and so essentially what this research aims to highlight is the connections and juxtapositions between each of these scales. Um, ultimately, my goal though is to highlight and make visible the, the kind of displacement of individuals and small groups caught in the everyday micro layers of our social or political. Um, to give an example of what we think about as infrastructure and why it might be political, um, this recent essay by Shannon Mattern, um, Paul Fount Fountain Society, um, evokes the otherwise mundane drinking fountain to discuss society's attitudes towards health, hygiene, public goods, and civic responsibilities. Um, she quotes um, political scientist Bonnie Honeg um, to argue that public things actually furnish the world of democratic life. So I don't know if you've all read, but like politics have artifacts, is the text that all of us had to read, but essentially how we think of daily objects um, as, as reinforcing and shaping our political lives is what I'm essentially doing. Um, in the same way that the fountain tells us about the politics of health, hygiene, and civic responsibility, uh, the 311 line, I argue, tells us about the fragmentation of infrastructure services, uh, the distribution of um, systemic failure across neighborhoods, and citizen participation in urban mainstream. <clears throat> um, an example of complaints made on 311, um, you can see here, these are just like a few snippets that I picked. Things like mundane things like a block driveway, illegal parking, graffiti, um, homeless person assistance. These are all sort of captured systems of failure by the system. And I would say that this kind of shows you couple of different things. Um, the first is that there are thousands of infrastructural disruptions that are happening around the city at any given time. And 311 actually serves as a way to capture and record a lot of those. Um, it also shows you a sense of what the New York government or the local institutions think of as disorder, um, which is essentially um, the constructed um, term here, right? Like, these are categories that people have coded in. Uh, nothing is effective. Um, 
It also gives you a sense of the vast and intricate network of New York City's organizational system, because you can think of everything from streets uh, to parking to um, homelessness, all of these different systems are coming into play when you're looking at this uh, list of disorders, essentially. Um, the last thing that I think is actually interesting is that the 311 complaint line actually makes itself invisible when you look at these complaints in this way. Um, you forget that this output is itself a system of organization. Instead, you get lost in the crises that it's supporting. Um, so turning to uh, an interesting art exhibition by Meryl uh, Ukelis, pronouncing that right. Um, um, she did this um, exhibition on maintenance art in, um, that was in early 2000s. Um, and it basically serves to question um, what the routine everydayness of um, maintenance looks like and how when we shine like a specific spotlight on it, it really tells you about the underlying political and sociological and economic um, crises that are actually um, underlying that. Um, so she ar argues um, that maintenance is a drag, that's fine, but um, <clears throat> essentially she has an excerpt of what she thinks of as maintenance. So um, clean your desk, wash your dishes, clean the floor, wash your clothes, wash your toes, all of these are just mundane everyday actions that you don't really think about um, because they become invisible to us. And what I'm trying to say and what I'm trying to gather from a lot of these arguments is that these everyday interactions are not benign. Um, and essentially, 311 is a system of maintenance in the same way washing your clothes, drying the dishes, all of these things are systems. And she calls it art. And here um, we're looking at crisis. So there's two different ways of spotlighting what maintenance is. She's made it an exhibition, and I'm trying to look at crisis as a kind of exhibit um, to understand. <clears throat> and you can see here, these are one of her um, exhibit pieces where she's actually photographed doing a bunch of routine everyday activities. Um, and it was supposed to be kind of uh, thought provoking as a white woman who's you know, fairly well off, has an arts degree, Kind of doing these things that are really not reserved for somebody like her um, on on the streets of New York. Um, similarly, Wendy Chun in her book "Updating to Remain the Same," which is an excellent book, so I'll read it if you haven't already. Um, she suggests that media matter the most when they uh, seem to not matter at all. So when they've moved from new to habitual, um, she argues that the smartphone, for example no longer amazes us, uh, but they increasingly structure and monitor our lives. Um, through habits, Chan says, new media become embedded in our lives. Indeed, we all become machines. We stream, we update, we capture, we upload, we link, save, trash, troll. All of these are mundane actions that we don't um, think to question. Um, and in the same way, um, infrastructure, um, I argue, has a mundane everydayness that uh, makes us overlook some of the politics that actually it seeks to hide. Um, and Chan actually has an argument that habit plus crisis equals update. Um, and she argues that uh, crisis is actually a moment when uh, the habituation of infrastructure um, is undone. Um, it undermines the autonomy of the habit. And in turn, um, and in turn uh, shows us that these are addictions that we've gotten accustomed to and it forces you to kind of make a change. Um, and so my question is, so what did the crisis of COVID-19 uh, do to the habitual, habitual systems of failure recorded on New York City's 311 complaint line? And what does it tell us um, about the spatial politics of Um, so in this section, I actually would like to discuss some of the agents of maintenance um, that we discussed previously. And these are essentially the users of 311 systems and their motivation. I won't actually be speaking to the, the work of maintenance itself, which I think is a category of exploration on its own. Um, but here we're talking about the people that actually interact with the system on, on a daily basis or at all. So. The 
the Rio one system was set up in New York in 2002, um, following early examples of them in Chicago, San Jose, and San Diego. Uh, Bloomberg announced um, his plans to install citywide service for non-emergency calls in 2002. Um, 311 platforms essentially act as citizen feedback systems. Um, they encourage city residents to behave like users or customers of a city, participating in urban management and maintenance and providing feedback on failures and disruptions in city services. But unlike customer um, feedback systems, citizen feedback systems serve as a contract between um, governments and its citizens. So citizens are actually able to pressure local governments to fix their street conditions, um, place police uh, parking violations, close down loud parties. You suddenly have a sense of um, uh, place um, in the process of maintenance of the city itself. And we'll be looking at what this looks like in the, in the pandemic moment. Um, Salim and Haq um, argue that the new normal in most organized societies requires that citizen engagement be expl explicitly embedded in uh, the design, development, and maintenance of urban infrastructure. So essentially, we always have a process to provide complaints and feedback. We have this in most private sector products and services as well. And essentially, it offers a way um, for these services to exist while making you feel like you're participating and contributing to them. Um, and we'll look at what kind of participation that actually entails. So the Plan IT NYC document uh, that was originally released when the 311 uh, line was getting set up, um, the vision was for New York City to use information technology to treat its residents, businesses, and visitors as customers, providing information services when desired, but eliminating the need to understand how city agencies are organized. So when you have an online system of interaction, you rarely feel like you're going through the bureaucratic process of getting somebody on the phone, figuring out which department to contact. You have like a one-stop shop to really understand um, or to make your complaint rather. So it really is more of a po portal than a two-way interaction um, of participation. Um, Scholarship has argued that the degree of accountability a platform has um, essentially depends on the level of participation it encourages um, and the extent to which user feedback impacts the development of a product or um, Because of the low cost, quick and easy access to government information and services that 311 encourages, um, it actually enables a high level of participation and has the potential to maybe democ democratize public discourse in a way uh, by allowing a diverse group of individuals to voice their concerns um, and report issues in their community. A Wall Street Journal report found that in 2020, the NYPD charged with enforcing the city's social distancing rules that we saw um, in a couple of slides ago, uh, they actually took action on four out of the 10 reported complaints, which is actually a pretty uh, impressive response rate and encouraging for more users to come on and uh, make requests them. So why actually participate, right? What is the motivation for users to participate or citizens or residents to participate in this system? Um, White and Trump um, have a study that argues that the act of placing a 311 call is actually a low cost form of political participation. Um, they argue that digital platforms like 311 offer city residents access to local government in a way that has shown to instill a sense of trust and promise of increased bureaucratic responsiveness. Um, here, you know, one might argue that um, these systems exist essentially to make you believe or feel like you're falsely believing that um, these systems are actually responding to you. And instead you just feel like you're participating in the maintenance of the city um, almost a, as a way to kind of um, like silence your actual participation. Um, but given the response rate, you know, this may actually not be true. So some of the reasons why people participate as scholarship has argued um, is to get access to information um, for a sense of community prestige and influence. Um, things like resident efficacy, right? Like some uh, individuals might actually feel like it's their duty to take care of their neighborhoods, uh, make sure they're being well maintained, make sure it's safe. Um, neighborhood reputation. Uh, some individuals might not want their neighborhood to be 
um, hot spots for noise or partying or um, garbage decay. Resident sentiment in general, like um, studies have shown that if residents in general feel pretty happy and proud of their neighborhood, they're more likely to call in 311 because they want to keep it up. Um, and lastly, um, there's a sense in which people tend to call into feedback systems, even the private ones, in order to lodge complaints about other users. And this is probably the most popular form of participation in most um, user feedback systems. And 311 is, um, in fact, the fact that it's called complaints or requests um, is pretty telling uh, in terms of what kinds of things people call in about. Um, so here I just wanted to kind of encourage you guys to think about the kind of governmentality a system like 311 encourages. Um, it's essentially a crisis management system that is promoted, that's focused on reaction, reactionary government fixes rather than long-term planning, right? So you call in about a broken window, you call in about illegal, illegal parking, someone can come in and make that fix right away. Um, but you're not really thinking about the longer-term systemic consequences uh, um, um, outcomes of some of those issues that maybe compound and make neighborhoods less or more vulnerable than others. Um, citizens are kind of turned customers that are encouraged to complain about the city and its citizens as a product or service. Uh, public policing um, grants some citizens neighborhood watchdog status, and it creates potential conditions for government surveillance, police misconduct, um, and potentially even a criminalization of certain neighborhoods uh, as, some, as some scholarship has argued. Um, so here you might ask, so is 311 truly a public good if it can actually lead to um, a lot of these negative consequences? And here um, I kind of will turn to this concept of broken windows, uh, which essentially is a theory of crime um, that popped up in the 1960s, especially in New York. Um, and since this, um, theory came about, uh, there's been a lot of scholarly and political attention paid to measuring the physical conditions of neighborhoods. Um, the theory actually says that um, when there's a broken window and it's left unrepaired, um, it's essentially doesn't elicit the window to be repaired, but more windows to be broken. So in a sense, if you look at disorder or disarray or decay, you're less likely to go fix it and more likely to compound these. Um, Robert Sampson's work on the stability of change of Chicago neighborhoods actually argues that perceptions of disorder are what molds reputation, reinforces stigma, and influences future tra trajectories of a neighborhood. Um, and it, his work highlights the important implications of perceptions of disorder um, and how they um, hold true for the evolution of urban neighborhoods. Um, experts have actually commented that the introduction of services like 311 um, um, make long-term residents um, tangled up essentially in the criminal justice system um, because they're complaining about quality of life crimes that draw in police to neighborhoods, which a lot of experts or scholars argue is highly unnecessary, uh, especially for the kinds of crimes that are being reported on. Um, so this is an excerpt from uh, Reinhold Martin's book, The Urban Apparatus. Um, and here, I'll, I'll just read it out. Uh, it's a great um, quote. A window here um, is a threshold between environmental order and environmental disorder that takes the form of what Kelling and Wilson call a signal. It is also in their account, a filter between orderly and disorderly beings, not as they say violent people, nor necessarily criminals, but disreputable or obstreperous or unpredictable people, panhandlers, drunks, addicts, rowdy teenagers, prostitutes, loiterers, the mentally disturbed. Um, it actually provides a picture of what um, the aesthetic of failure um, looks like and what it might mean for urban neighborhoods in general. Um, and according to Martin, the aesthetic of urban order actually accounts for its outcome. So if a uh, neighborhood is disorderly, it's more likely that the outcome um, of the, in terms of e economic, social, political, um, is actually negative as well because of the disorderly appearance. So then one might ask, is 311 an important infrastructure of record keeping um, and who actually benefits from the existence of the service? 
<clears throat> um, I'll just gloss over this. Are running low on time. Um, but essentially, social socioeconomic disparities in the spatial one is what we are most concerned with in the study. Um, and questions like, are people more likely to call in from less vulnerable neighborhoods, considering the work, work and windows paradigm? Are they likely to call more if they are increasingly vulnerable? What happens during moments of crisis? Um, studies have shown there actually evidence that 311 and 911 calls are rising unevenly in gentrifying neighborhoods. Um, as demographic, demographic shifts, activity that was previously considered normal becomes suspicious as newcomers, many of whom are white or different ethnicities and other neighborhoods are more inclined to get law enforcement involved. So why does this all matter? Um, we get to the question of geography. Um, just briefly, information geography is a stream of scholarship that argues that geographic augmentations or digital augmentations of place are much more than just representations of places. They're actually part of the place itself and shape it as much as they reflect it. So in the same theoretical vein as what we're thinking of as infrastructure that is constantly shaping and shaped by society, um, um, information geography is a way to think about code or data spread across space that acts as a kind of infrastructure uh, that shapes and is both shaped by um, political, social. The information geography of 311 then is the spatialization of the repeated records of infrastructure disruption. Um, and it matters because it tells a story of how spaces and therefore neighborhoods are counted, perceived, engaged with, and transformed by the po politics of a city. <clears throat> and consequently, spatial patterns of 311 requests actually hint at probable shifts in future dynamics of that neighborhood as well. Um, so reasons why it matters, this research is that it potentially gives uh, local authorities or governments um, an understanding of participation hotspots and cold spots in New York City during an emergency, it offers a calibration of the level of service demands placed on city governments by individual neighborhoods. And it is suggestive of subtle forms of conflict um, and it potentially even a deepening of mistrust uh, between ne ne um, neighbors in select neighborhoods. Um, and why all of this matters during a moment of crisis is that during periods of relative stability, neighborhood sentiments typically remain consistent. However, when new realities come about, like the foreclosure crisis and COVID-19, there are new ways of living um, that come about, and the upheaval may challenge prior assumptions um, as individuals and communities are forced to confront deeper systemic issues and intersecting tensions that arise. Um, the New York City stay-at-home order, in addition to COVID, um, did elicit a radical shift in the demand for infrastructure services. and um, I argue that the uneven impacts of the pandemic on residents of color in underserved low income, low income communities are revealed in the information geography of 311. And now I'm going to breeze through the findings as a little less. <laughs> but this is essentially <laughs> this is essentially the different data sets I looked at. Um, I looked at six years of 311 data. Um, I looked at the social vulnerability index uh, at the census tract level, and I looked at COVID-19 case rates between 2020 and 2021. And methodologically, just briefly, um, I did two different um, machine learning regression analyses. The first one, I did a um, time series uh, prediction model, essentially, that looks at five years of uh, 311 data between 2015 and 2020. Um, and it forecasts what 2020 would look like, essentially, and then we compare it with actual complaints to see uh, the level of difference um, in, the, in the service request itself. Um, and then I use the SVI to kind of give us an indicator of um, the neighborhood vulnerability and how that coincides with a uh, level of uh, complaints in those neighborhoods as well, and I look at COVID. Um, so this is the first bit of the analysis. And the second one, I do um, machine, I, I just do uh, multivariate regressions to look at uh, three different models um, and see what kind of um, 
correlations we find. Um, um, so here you could see the time series plot shows uh, two distinct phases um, of uh, the pandemic. Essentially, the black line is actual 311 complaints, and the red line <clears throat> is the forecasted 311. Um, so you could see there's an initial surge in calls during the onset of the pandemic, peaking August 2020, around 300,000 calls. And you know, one can argue this might be due to like the phase reopening. That was the, uh, the time in which I think we were in phase three, where restaurants and things were opening as well. And that might be <clears throat> a consideration here. Um, but overall, the level of complaints still remained above pre-pandemic levels, even um, at the end of our study period. And here you could see the total 311 requests in 2020 were about 2,700,000, uh, those of which were related to social disorder were about half of that, which is pretty significant. And I define social disorder complaints below here. Um, there are two different studies that categorize complaints based on um, different types of social disorder. And I um, use that coupled with my well. If you look at the forecasted complaints, um, it's about 500,000 complaints off of the, what the average number of complaints would be for 2020. And social disorder complaints is almost double here as well. So really, there was a lot of calls related to social disorder and a significantly higher proportion of calls um, during the pandemic. Um, and here, I've essentially mapped out the change in 311 requests um, between uh, the previous um, model, which is like um, 2015 to 2020, and the zip codes for uh, 2020 alone. And here you can see the darker spots um, are where the percentages are higher than average, and the lighter ones are where the model is per, um, essentially under predicting uh, complaints. And on the, on the other map, you see essentially social vulnerability index uh, coupled with the COVID um, case count. And so you get a sense of one correlations between COVID case rates and social vulnerability. And then you can start to piece together a story of um, the level of service demand from 311 and social vulnerability and COVID triangulating. Um, these are some of the neighborhoods with the highest 311 service request demands in 2020. Um, the largest discrepancy was identified in Eden Walk, uh, which is the Bronx, um, where the DOITP actually fielded, um, I think, 76,000 more calls than the model actually predicted, which is um, And although the Bronx did not actually have the highest rate of COVID uh, among the city's boroughs, outcomes in the Bronx were reported to be more severe with the highest hospitalization and death rates, which might explain some of the discrepancies. Um, moreover, 90% of Bronx res residents are minority residents, and many are also essential workers. More than 70% of the Bronx workforce uh, works in face-to-face -face industries, especially during that time. Um, but despite the model's underestimation of call volumes in these neighborhoods, the results are generally consistent with areas known for their active participation in um, the digital platform. Um, in contrast, the neighborhoods that most overestimated by the models uh, were Hell's Kitchen um, with an excess prediction of 2,700 complaints, followed by uh, places inside Staten Island, Windsor Terrace in Brooklyn. These are all fairly well-off neighborhoods that have lower SVI scores, um, hinting at a potentially inverse relationship between forecasted complaint patterns and so <laughs> These are some of the results from the models uh, that we looked at. So I essentially have four different models here. The first one looks at complaints between 2015 and 2020, five years of training data, essentially. And I look at the regression of that with um, just SVI. You can see social vulnerability definitely impacts the level of um, 301 requests, but not compared to the later models. Um, the second one looks at COVID-19 and its relationship, the, the request during COVID-19 and its relationship just to SVI. Um, again, it's about 30%, so still fairly significant model. You can see they're um, all significant. 
values, but it gets more and more significant as we look at SVI and COVID together, like model 2A essentially um, is our model of best fit where it's almost 75% of requests um, can be predicted based on the social vulnerability of the neighborhood and the level of COVID rates uh, in that neighborhood. And you can see the ARIMA, the forecasted models don't actually well, um, social um, high compare it with social vulnerability. So essentially what my research uh, has contributed to um, hopefully is literature on information geography. And I've aimed to tell a story of uneven participation in government services during emergency uh, situations like COVID. Um, and departing from other research and in information geography literature, this research actually finds that an increased digital participation amongst socially vulnerable communities um, during moments of crisis is observed. So in other literature on information geography, you often see that things like the digital divide play a huge part in who participates in different services platforms. Here, um, you actually see in moments of crisis, um, vulnerable groups tend to turn to the government for assistance and help, um, which you know, brings us to questions of public trust uh, before and after an emergency. Uh, what kind of individuals are most vulnerable during these times? Are these individuals that actually remained in the city while others were leaving um, due to work from home, um, um, audiences? their work, et cetera. Um, and I will end with some closing remarks and then we can open up questions. Hopefully there wasn't a lot coming at you, but um, some of the limitations um, I would observe in the study is that um, problems that are actually reported on 311 occur unevenly across neighborhoods. So there's really only so much you can speculate in terms of um, the variation and opportunity to complain, like some neighborhoods just have poor infrastructures, they're going to have more potholes, so there's probably more people complaining about that. There's also a risk of a few heavy users uh, or super users of 311 in a neighborhood that could have a significant influence on the total number of calls from that area. Um, and this is not something you can gauge from the data, so it is definitely um, And the last one, which is actually what I would like to focus some of my future work on, is that I've only looked at SVI as a baseline indicator of um, socioeconomic disparity, but I think more nuanced indicators of conflict and difference within neighborhoods, such as uh, measures of gentrification, um, would be an interesting future study uh, for um, some future questions that I'm left with at the end of this work is, you know, what can studying differences in 311 participation crisis events? Um, tell us about neighborhood cohesion, sent a resident sentiment, and trust in the state. So maybe it's between COVID and the foreclosure crisis or Hurricane Sandy. Like, are there different levels of demand? Are there differences in participation between neighborhoods between these crisis events as well? And what can that really tell us about um, some of the things? Um, New York City police data on arrests during this time might also be interesting to collate with. Um, the level of service demands, especially looking at some of the police related complaints that um, 311 captures. Um, another question I had is what kind of infrastructure failures are actually normalized during uh, a moment of crisis like COVID and in which neighborhoods? So, which of these um, systemic failures kind of become permanent, wherein people stop complaining about them because they're so routine? Um, you know, in Colombia, it might be there's an issue of street trees being cut down or something like that, and you stop noticing them, people stop complaining about them. There are like routines of failure that get absorbed in space. And um, an interesting exercise would be to kind of dig up some of the failures that we've absorbed since the crisis of COVID. And lastly, for my data folk in here, um, should 311 data actually be open access considering a lot of the um, negative consequences we've seen through this in terms of who's actually being captured in the data, um, what does they say about the people that are captured, um, where are the gaps, um, do we think this kind of data should really only be available to institutions or um, should it be um, open access just to universities? These are some questions that are worth 
And yeah, I'll stop here. I'm open for questions. Thank you. Thank you. It was a great Thank you. Uh, any questions? Uh, who, who, who didn't record that they have COVID? Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting question. So things like people that don't test or maybe don't get yeah. vaccinated and there's a correlation. Yeah, super interesting study. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so that's why I had in my slide here that police um, brutality correlation between that and the kind of complaints that were made um, is something that's worth looking into. I, I did not look into it, um, but I think that's an area for future that could be. I will say it is harder to collate um, just because you're going to really have to look into the timing of things and that gets a bit shady. Um, we don't know how well they capture um, um, live requests. Everyone wants either, so it, it gets a bit tricky, but not impossible. Uh, so like plus how the food we are for that. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely uh, a possibility, right? Like, I think New York City was promoting much more as like a hotline to um, complain about non uh, police officers. So, I think that's definitely that it's just there was more awareness about it, um, which is also interesting. You know, like, um, is it because of a lack of awareness? Who is previously aware? Like, for the Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't have all my findings up here, but yes, there were. Um, there were specifically more calls related to the uh, social distance violation. Uh, and you can see neighborhoods as well called in more about those. I broke down the maps by types of as well. If you guys are interested, you can read the presentation. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's an interesting question of like what becomes routine. Right? Like um, a lot of the policies that were put in place <clears throat> by the city during COVID was things like you could drink outside in the park. That was not something you were allowed to do before. And so things like illegal drinking, which is a complaint type in 
one one, you actually don't see a lot of because it becomes normalized. It becomes um, other things like um, mask violations are high in 2020, but in 2022, you see that not cropping up because it's um, a failure of a system to become repeat. In a way, we all still should be wearing masks, and that is a system not failing. But us failing to wear a mask is actually a systemic failure. We're thinking about politics. So that is a way in which fails and become that you can actually. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I've been looking into it. I think, you know, there's a lot of controversy around social media data, but I think in terms of publicly available um, data, it does give you a kind of sense of like resident sentiment or like neighborhood sentiment that is worth looking into. Um, if you take the proper precaution, get data. I think there is something there. Um, there's a lot of ACS data that really captures. Um, you know, different things that are not really captured in the SVI. There's ways to like couple different data, like maybe there's resident sentiment from media. There's some um, HCS variables that you can find as well. Um, there is privately available data, um, like some of the mo mobile phone, um, cap like mobile phone mobility data, like safe graph and things. I think that could point to things like who's able to leave during COVID and that tells us about like, like who's a um, essential worker, things like that. All these are extrapolations, but you know, as with all data, most of it is made up really about how you argue your case. And I, um, what these models really start to tell us are kind of theories or they show us patterns, um, but they're really not our um, um, issue, right? Like we want to. Uh, combine it with things like qualitative and I'll have interviews, um, but they do give us insightful hints of processes that are going on. Yeah, citizens actually are good. Uh, well, I think, yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, I actually think it's similar to 311, except it's not public, right? It is, yeah. um, but I actually think it allows for maybe more forms of um, neighborhood policing or watchdogging kind of um, where you feel like it's your responsibility to report other people more so than here, where largely people do actually complain about the city failing of its streets or um, some of the services. So. I think to me that feels a little bit more invasive on actually complaining. Um, and I think there's questions of like access as well to app, like how many people have um, smartphones that can download that. 311, you can actually still pick up the phone and call. So, um, yeah. That's a two part question. <laughs> Usually, um, yeah, I think that's one of like the big, but I think having that kind of data also would make one one not open and accessible, um, a lot of privacy violations. Um, I think looking at space helps, and that's what I'm mostly interested in because you get a sense of demographics, but in spatial terms. Um, so you can kind of grasp at, at a group level, this neighborhood has this number of, um, racial minorities, this, this number of people that are college educated, you can get a sense of things like that from the data, um, which is what I've captured here, the SVI. But I think beyond that, having um, individual level markers, I think it's what we get.
Yeah, there is actually a data on three one one time. It's not as complete as some of the other data. Um, and it also takes time to upload, right? Like some of them take days and just like missing values. How do you deal with those? Again, those are things you deal with when you're analyzing the data. You can choose to use them um, and then treat the missing values however you theoretically decide makes sense. Um, but that is a limit with using. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, so there's a whole media politics of like categorization itself, right? Which is like, how do we name things? Like the taxonomy of calling things thing um, is interesting. They do have what, what seems like, at least to me, um, a pretty straightforward way of categorizing. Like, you're going to know if it's like illegal parking or like XYZ violation. And they have two different layers of recording. So you can Put a descriptor, which would vary based based on who's doing it, but then there's a category of complaints, which I would guess maybe falls into the same. But you're right. I mean, maybe there's some um that's a limitation as well. Like maybe you categorize their box in that case. Um, but because we're dealing with like such massive amounts of data, like millions of millions of data points, unlikely like something like that would impact the result as much, but yeah. Uh, I think we're up to time if uh, you have any questions, I guess. Uh, no. <laughs> so um, thank you again for you. taking the time and taking this uh, cool call. Um, thanks everyone for attending tonight. Uh, next week, uh, at the same time, uh, please join us for our next speaker, Dr. Nisha Anand, in his lecture on predominant rate of stormwater drains and for coastal futures. And yeah, thank you all. Thank you.